during this event tonight. Let's pray. Almighty God, we recognize that our lives are in your hand, that your love for each of us is greater than all the powers of earth. We know that you grieve our pain, that you gather our tears in your bottle. We ask you to be with us this evening as we come together to talk about the power of guns and how gun violence has affected our lives as individuals. Give us grace to listen to each other with compassion, to feel your empowering presence as we work for healing in our community. Calm our fears with your spirit among us. Show us the paths in which we can work towards your justice and harmony in our troubled world. Let us be your compassionate presence in our community. Amen. Rachel's Day is a program begun by the women of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in the 90s. There's a handout there on the table. If you didn't get it, there's a, probably a better description of what Rachel's Day is about. Um, it was started in a, a small congregation in Chicago that was overwhelmed with gun violence against their children. Our local chapter here, Grace, has been observing Rachel's Day for many years. And this year, the Sarah Circle is presenting this evening in an effort to increase our and our understanding about the use of guns in our society. The first part of our program is our speaker, and I'm going to let Kathy Sankar introduce him. Okay, as Judy said, I'm Kathy Stancar, <clears throat> and this year, and for the next couple of years, I'll be the president of Welco. And I've known Erin for quite some time now. We met not at the jail. <laughs> he works at the jail. Erin was uh, Aaron Rummage, and he works at the jail as a sheriff's deputy, but he was a Navy SEAL, and I would like to introduce him now. Thanks, Erin. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. How are y'all this evening? Good. Um, like Miss Kathy said, I was in the uh, SEAL team for 16 years. Out of my 21, totally in the Navy. Um, I'm retired. I couldn't stay retired, so now I work for the sheriff's office. Um, I do work in the jail. Uh, I enjoy it. Some days it's great. Some days it's not so great. But it's just like any other time. Um, I've been there almost four years now. Wouldn't change a thing. I'm going to stay there until I retire. If I make it that long. I'll be 50 this year, so we'll see how long I can. Uh, this evening, we're going to talk about gun violence. It is a very, very sticky subject. There are many, many different opinions of gun violence. What should be done about it? The laws governing it? The laws governing guns? People who can own People who shoot at it? We're not going to get into all of it. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to give you cold hard facts from information that we can get at the sheriff's office that I pulled this morning. So it's as up to date as we can get other than what happened in the last nine hours because it's six o'clock and I pulled this information by nine o'clock. So this is as up to date as we can get. I'm going to go over some of it. I'm going to go over what I see coming in and out of our jail, the arrest, the calls that we have during the year, that time, to give you what's going on around here. Um, this is an open discussion. If you guys have anything you want to ask me, I'm going to open it up to questions over here. I'll be glad to answer anything. Be careful to answer me out here, but I'll answer it, and I'll give you the truth. I don't know any other way to be that honest. I don't sugarcoat anything. So, what you'll get from me is the honest truth. Everybody say hi to my wife. She just walked in. <laughs> That's Rhonda, by the way. Um, all right, we're going 
we'll start off with just a few things here. Gun violence in 2023. We as a nation are not as of this morning, total number of gun violent deaths, all cases, it doesn't matter if it's suicide, murder, suicide, or gun on gun, gun on knife, it doesn't matter. Total gun violent deaths as of this morning is 20,150. Last year, last year, all of last year, 2022, there was 20,200. So we're halfway through the year. We got a long way to go. We're not doing really well. You go back to 2021, we did a little better last year than 2021. We had 21,009. The lowest since 2016 was 2018. It was 14,900. So like I said, we're at 20,150. We're not good. That's nationwide. That is nationwide. And I pulled some results, and you can go, y'all can go online, you can pull information. There are so many different websites, so many different news sites. You name it, everybody's got a different one. This I pulled from what we got, we can get sheriff's office. That comes from law enforcement around the country. You know, news stations are just like anything else. You don't get political opinions about it. And those opinions can go from one end of the spectrum to the other. And that's not really cool. We don't need to get into that. I'm going to give you what, what's going on. All right. Homicide, murder, and unintentional gun deaths 8,798. As of this morning. Suicides, we're not doing very well at all. Suicides, we are at 11,352. Yes, sir. That's suicide by death. We have 17,225 whether those are accidental shooting, somebody cleaning it, shooting the foot, whatever. $17,220. Mass shootings. There are 319 deaths of shootings. Last year, we had 607 for mass shootings at all. We're at 319 already, so we're about, about to start. Close. Okay. Here's where it gets kind of Number of children aged 0 to 11 that have died this year already. 133. Children. 307 have been injured. Number of teens 12 to 17. 717. 1,909 12 17 and we'll do this up in a minute these are the ones that are getting a hold of mommy and daddy or that's my first or being young and playing or getting a hold of each other in the school or doing something else we have 27 officers that have been killed this year 25 185 have been injured. Five hundred and thirty-five deaths this year have been because of defensive injuries. Without from a register owner gun or you don't even have to have your concealed kit. You just have a gun in your house. Somebody breaks in, they get shot. Five hundred and thirty-five people have been killed by defensive use of guns. Unintentional shootings. 752. Murder suicides, 318. One out of every 10 gun deaths are aged 19 or younger. 
Firearm deaths occur at a rate of more than five times higher than Brown. Since Columbine in 1999, I know everybody remembers that, that's the first tweet named Peter that I remember. Since 1999, more than 338,000 students in the United States have experienced gun violence. There are more school shootings, there were more school shootings in 2023 than any other year since Columbine. In 2022, 34 students and adults died, while more than 43,000 children were exposed to gun violence. Here, here, the, here's the big statistics that we as parents, and parents, parents and uncles really pay attention to. 4.6 million American children live in a home where there is at least one gun kept loaded. Guns used in 68% of gun-related incidents at school were taken from the home in Florida. There are baby daddies somewhere, but they're not involved with their children. I know when I was growing up, <sighs> lost my dad two years ago, and it still stinks. But when I was left at home, I knew if I got a gun out, I played with a gun, my butt was in trouble when they got home. I knew what was going to happen. There was no questions. You know, I would go, I've been shooting with my father. Thank you. Some tough Navy guy, huh? Um, I, went, I started shooting with my father at age eight or nine. I knew how to handle a gun, but I knew when I was at home and it was put away, that's where it stayed. So many kids nowadays don't have that. They have nothing. You know, they're raised on the internet. They're raised on TV and video games. There was a Marine Corps colonel that wrote a book and I'm, I'm sorry, I do not remember his name. But he said, every shooter is not a gamer, but every gamer, excuse me, every gamer is not a shooter, but every shooter is a gamer. He's not far from wrong. Now, I will tell you this. Kids nowadays, they need us. They do. I do more mentoring at work than you can imagine. And I'm talking to kids between the age of 19 and some almost 30. And it doesn't happen often, but it does happen. I, I did have a young lady come up and tell me one time at the Apple Festival. Came up out of the blue and I didn't even recognize her. She looked so totally different. I just, from right here is about all I could, and I heard her voice. And she just said, I want to thank you for what you did. I mean, what did I do? You were you. You talked to me. You encouraged me. You told me what to do. Told me the right thing to do. Told me I had to swallow my pride with my parents. She said, well, I have my kids back. I have my life on track. And I just want to thank you. It doesn't happen often, but it happens. And I'm proud to say that that young lady's doing very well. Um, now. We can go on and on about, the, about these kids. It's not going to change, and it's only going to get worse. And one of the main reasons that I see is the way society portrays a man or what they expect out of a man. Used to years ago, and I see you're a combat vet, so I know the Army and the Navy, the Army and the Marines, the Navy and the Marines, no offense to you Air Force boys, but we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> if y'all had a disagreement when you were younger, what'd you do? You went and you had a fist fight. 
Well, whoever won the fist fight won the argument, and you went and bought each other a beer, and you were friends after that. When I was young in the Navy, if you had a disagreement, you went in a fan room. You bounced each other off the wall a few times. The first one out the door is the one who won the argument. There was no hard feelings. Nowadays, it's not that way. If somebody gets in a fight, well, that guy whipped me. I've got to do one better. So guess what? Here comes a knife or a gun, and they don't care. We had a gentleman sentenced last year. He was sentenced to life in prison without parole because of that very thing. He took a butt whooping, and he took a good one. 30 minutes later, he drives by a house where the guy who whipped his tail lived, and he just decided to shoot into the house. No rhyme or reason, he just shot into the house. Killed two people and shot a five-year-old at the same time. Luckily, the five-year-old lived, but he still shot him. Well, he's doing life in prison without parole. Okay. Um, a lot of cities, you have this violence. We're lucky we don't have that around here. <coughs> Not saying it couldn't happen. And as, as a rule, North Carolina does a very, very good job with this. Um, pulled a statistic this morning. When it comes to all the cities in the country, major cities, Hendersonville doesn't count, Asheville would be considered about as small as they would go in this. North Carolina's highest ranked city is number 21 in the nation. Anybody have any idea what that city would be? Charlotte. Not quite. Winston-Salem. Yep. Charlotte was like number 50 something. Mm -hmm. Winston-Salem was number 21 when it comes to violent crimes. That's the highest ranked North Carolina city. So we're, we're very lucky around here. Um, the state of North Carolina has a very good sheriff's association and we are lucky to have some very good sheriffs here, North Carolina and South Carolina. Our sheriff is outstanding. Sometimes he may not be very popular with his opinions because he said, if you shoot us or you assault us, we're gonna shoot back or we're gonna assault you back. I've heard the sheriff say, we're undefeated. You're not gonna beat us. The sheriff has our backs, which is a good thing. We don't go above him or overboard, but if we have to handle somebody, we handle them. We don't infringe on their rights. We don't go too far, but that's what needs to happen. Uh, another gentleman who was a Marine Corps colonel, and I, I'm probably going to mess this up, he did say that the offenders, they're not afraid of the police. They're not afraid of the judicial system. They're not afraid of the prison system. The only way you're going to stop them is to protect yourself. And like I said, 535 people who were trying to commit gun violence on somebody were shot and killed by somebody else who had a gun, who has it legally. Though that's where you get into your varying opinions. Some people don't like guns. Some people don't want them in their house. I support that, if that's the way you feel. My wife is not a huge fan of guns. I have about 30. <laughs> And when my son lived with us, who just moved to Mississippi a couple weeks ago, we probably had closer to 50. But they're all put away, locked away. And if a child is in my house, you can better believe they can't get to them. Um, I remember my father telling me telling a story. Um, my mother's, uh, my mother's mother, my grandmother's house. After she passed away. She had a long hallway and there was a little closet at the end of the hall and a bathroom down here. And my cousins and I, from the time we were this big, it was, it was a running, you know, run up and down the hallway. You get in the closet, you can play. There was so much stuff in there. There was a loaded 30-30 in there for over 35 years. That could have been bad news. That could have been bad news. You know, the accidental shootings when it comes to kids, 
every last one of them could have been prevented. Y'all remember several months ago, out near Edneyville, had a four-year-old shot? Because somebody had a loaded weapon, didn't put it away. Now, I still, I still have no idea how a four-year-old picked up a full-frame semi-automatic pistol and pulled the trigger. I still don't understand that. I got a three-year-old number 15. But, <laughs> I get it. But, you know, there, there were multiple adults around. I don't know the dynamics. It's, I can't even get into the investigation. But it happened. And it can happen. I mean, we all know, you turn your back on an 18-month or two-year-old, you turn, you turn around, they're gone. Same thing can happen with a four or five-year-old. All they got to do is pick it up. People talk about automatic weapons, assault weapons. Well, I've given talks about assault weapons and the difference between assault rifle and a hunting rifle. Done it many times. If you know what you're doing, it doesn't matter what you carry. I can do as much damage on a target with a 22 long rifle as I can a 5.56 and an AR platform. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you carry. Now, who's carrying this stuff? What laws are governing it? Well, I can tell you right now, they're out of, as of eight or well, nine o'clock this morning, there were 147 people in my jail. Eight of them, eight out of those 147 have a charge of possession of firearm by felon. Okay? Law clearly states you're a convicted felon. You cannot own or carry or have in your possession a firearm of any type. There are eight out of 147. That's the ones that have been caught. How many other convicted felons are out there driving around the street with a gun under their seat? Ron is right, every one of them. You're a convicted felon. There's a reason you're a convicted felon, especially the ones who are in the drug field. They're scared to death. They're going to get robbed. Somebody's going to take their stuff. They say it's for protection. No, it's not. Most of it's for intimidation. But like I said, out of 147, and that's the ones that have just been caught. And I have, I have gone over and I have looked at statistics when it comes to race. It doesn't matter when they're convicted felons. It's all about equal. I can tell you that in the Hispanic community, gun violence is about twice what it is in the white communities. In the black communities, it's between three and four times more than in white communities. Black children under the age of 16 see more gun violence from the time they're born to the time they're 16 than most of us will ever even hear about. And the reason is, most of it is not even talked about. The media gets hold of things, they blow it out of proportion, or they report it, as it should be. You never know. You never know exactly what the truth is. But in the black communities, it's far worse than any other. And, and it doesn't matter the economic scale, the, the what you would call impoverished, there, it's, it's, the, it's the worst community for gun violence by far. Um, we see that, um, I know everybody hears about Chicago, all the killings going on in Chicago. Where do those killings happen? That gun violence is happening in the poorest sections of Chicago. The high rise, what we used to call, well, the hood, 
or the projects. That's what it was called back in the 70s. Yeah. The projects. That's where all this stuff is happening. You know, what can we do to stop it? Well, coming from the sheriff's office, and I, I'm not speaking for the sheriff, I'm not speaking on behalf of the sheriff's office. I'm telling you what I see. We do as much as we can. In Henderson County, we have approximately 10 deputies on the road at any one time. That's 10 deputies per squad. Now, we have a couple other units um, that can be out there that cover the, the uh, parks. We have another couple units that help out DSS. And we have, you know, the animal control units that are still deputies that can ha help out with this stuff. But uh, I'm going to tell you, and I, have, and I have to pull this up so we can go as of right this minute. For 2023, this is June, we are looking at 59,000. 250 calls for service. That's the sheriff's office and EMS. Average that out per day. How many is that per day calls for service? Now, some of those, like right now, one, two, we have two traffic stops going on, a health and welfare check, th another traffic stop, and an extra security. So some of those calls, like the extra security, hmm, You know, it still counts as a call, but 59,250, that's where we're at. By the end of the year, we're 115,000, 120,000 calls. The other day, well, the other night, I should say, I was, I was off, I was at home. There were 19 calls for the sheriff's office going on at one time. And at 10, 11 o'clock at night, you've got 10 officers on the road. It's hard, you know, it's hard for us to keep up. And we do a good job of keeping up. Excuse me. We do a good job of keeping up. You know, there are other departments that are not so lucky. They don't have near the manpower. We're just lucky that Fletcher has their own little department. Laurel Park has a department. Laurel Park, I think I've seen Laurel Park in my jail on my squad 10 times in four years. They don't arrest a whole lot of people in Laurel Park. <laughs> and most of the ones that they do arrest are not the ones that they know they're not supposed to be there. So, you know, we do the best we can. What can you do yourself? Does anybody know what you can do yourself to help this out? Sir? Lock up your guns. Lock up your guns. That's right. But I can honestly tell you, I don't have one on me right now because it's in my, it's in my Jeep. But usually if I have pants on, I've got a gun on me. And just from me. I mean, my whole background, you know, I'm pretty alert of what goes on. I had my own personal concealed carry weapon stolen out of my own truck in my own driveway. Yeah. Now, it happened sometime during the middle of the night and I don't know what happened to both of my dogs who will bark if a leaf rolls across the front yard. <laughs> but they didn't bark. If they had, we would be having a very different conversation about these people right now. Um, Officer Ryan Hendricks, it would have been a very similar subject to that. Um, September. Ma'am? When you keep your gun in the mm -hmm. truck, do you keep the bullets separate? No, ma'am. So well, it's 
and I had two. One I keep, uh, one I kept. I don't have that truck anymore, but there was a special little compartment that you wouldn't know what it was unless you had a truck like that. What I had done, and this it's completely my fault, I took my gun out of my waistband because it was inside the waistband and it was just, it was kind of getting uncomfortable. So I took it out and I put it in the center console, covered it up. I forgot. Well, guess what? It's out there on the street somewhere. So is it one of the rules, if, if you do have a gun in your home, uh, that the bullet should be in a separate place, that you shouldn't keep it loaded? Really? That, that, is, that is all opinion. There is no law say, stating that. That is a matter of opinion. My opinion is a gun is worthless with the bullets aren't in it. If I need it, I need it loaded. Because I don't need to be trying to fumble around and try to load it if somebody's breaking in my front door. But, there again, that's a matter of opinion. If people feel safer that way, then that absolutely that's what you should do. If you have children in the house, absolutely. If the guns are not in a safe, if, if they're stacked in a closet, or like my dad, they were in old, old leather soft bags, the guns were under mom and dad's bed. But the ammunition was always somewhere else. Sir? Ma'am. Do you carry each gun because you're a police officer or would you always have one? These days and time, I would probably always have one. So are you recommending that people should have guns in their home? If you feel safe with them, how does that make you feel safe? If you have the gun separate from the bullet. I don't. Mm -hmm. Okay, someone comes to your door, you're going to say, oh, he's going to rob me. Mm -hmm. By the time you get the bullets and everything in. That's true. Okay. But, like I said, it's, it's all a matter of opinion. If you feel safer having a gun and having the bullet somewhere else, that's what you need to do. I can't tell you what to do. I'll tell you what I do and what other people do. But I know quite a few people who have guns. Their guns are locked in a safe. All their ammunition is locked in another safe. But if you want to protect yourself, it's all up to you and how you want to do that. Yes, ma'am. So I understand that you know, mm -hmm. there could be different ways of yes. sure things are safe. I specifically work with families with very young children, mm -hmm. five, five and um, And we, of course, advise them, you know, if you have firearms, they need to be not in reach in any way If they want something for protection, they make individual little small safes that will hold one handgun. There's a combination on top. It's not, it's not easy, like you know, three or four or five year olds not just gonna be able to do this. And it's, and it's a handprint kind of thing. They do make them, they're palm readers. They're expensive, but you can put your palm on it, it'll read it, it'll open the door. And if you scan, but, most people will have a single combination, put your fingers on there, you've got a certain combination that you push in, and then it'll open. I recommend anybody that has small children, keep them in a safe. If you need it, have the safe, you know, if you're in the bedroom, have it close by if you need it. Have it to where you can get to it, but have it in a safe. Quick combination that you know, and then get the door, Get it open, and you can use it. You know, but if there are small kids, I mean, they used to say, I mean, I remember when I was going through uh, hunter safety when I was in the ninth grade. They'd say, if you have a gun and it's loaded, there's kids in the house, keep it on the top shelf. Kids can climb. <laughs> you know? I always recommend putting them in a safe, especially if there's going to be small children around. Sure, go ahead. Because of my work, also aging adults with dementia. Yes. Is another sector. Um, yes. Someone may think in their mind that, oh, I'm a hunter. Let me go get my gun. But they have dementia. 
Well, just the sheer fact of a caregiver coming to, if it's a new caregiver that they don't recognize, oh, they just broke into the house. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So, um, but yeah, it's, and, and, and like I said, there, we could have, I mean, we could sit here and talk about this till next week. Yes, sir. Oh, I have. I have, yes. I will have to ask Sheriff Griffin that. Um, we ha I know we have tried in the past for things, just, I mean, simple things like that that are, you know, that are mass produced that are under a dollar. That could make a difference. Well, that's not, and this, this is going to sound horrible, but that's not where the people want the big money spent. And, and I understand it. Luckily, we don't have as big of a problem around here. I know other cities have done something like that, but that would have to be something that we would have to, as well, the sheriff would have to put out to the county, and we just have to see who showed up. Because a lot of people, and I know quite a few of them, they're I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do that because I'm not going to have to you know, fumble with a key if I need it. You know, it's, I hate to say it's, it's a great idea. If you, you know, I would, I, I would welcome it for anybody who wanted it. And it would be a smart idea for, for me to even have something like that on my guns, whether I'm using them or not, if I plan on using them for home defense. And like, yeah, at night, you could leave the key in it. Mm-hmm. I, I will I will ask him about that because that's a good idea and I know the sheriff has been wanting to do a few programs, new programs. We're having, you know, good success with the star program and the kids and things. So this might be another bug to put in his ear. Because I know we've done the uh, take backs before on weapons, the amnesty turn ins, I know we've done those before. So that would be another good thing. Yes. We do, but it's not too bad. Um, most of the time, most of the time, it's drivers from South Carolina or Tennessee that we have the problems with. <laughs> That's the, and I'm, I'm just telling you what I see. Right, exactly. But here, here again, I go back to, you know, how things, how people's, you know, personalities are changing. Well, he can't do that. Well, he just flipped me off, so I got to speed up and flip him off. Yeah. Or I got to flip him off and look at him real mean. Well, what's he going to do? Exactly. <laughs> and then, you know, the next thing you know, then, you know, somebody's pulled a gun out. Or they're trying to bump you or push you off the road. That's mainly what we see. Road rage, people getting mad, getting cut off, especially in that I-26 parking lot mess that's going on right now. Oh, yeah. We have it, and it happens every now and then. You know, they'll pull over at the, uh, they'll pull over there at the uh, Naples exit or the uh, Four Seasons Boulevard exit. Those are the two main exits yeah. that we get calls to. Now, usually the city of Hendersonville will get that, but if we're already behind them, or something then you know but those are the two main exits that we get those at and it's people who are mad and, and generally they're just yelling and screaming because somebody got cut off is what it is so around here it's we we don't have much problem with that but like i said most of the ones that we do is from south carolina or tennessee 
Yes. You, you think that you have a child support or a children's program? We have, it's called the STAR camp, a STAR program, and it's geared towards uh, children. Most of them are underprivileged children. Getting them out, and it, and it gets them, instead of, like a lot of parents, you know, that's cop, you need to stay away from them. They're bad people. It gets them, you know, with actual officers, and most of them are uh, SROs or school resource officers, that they're, all, they're not off duty, but they're not at school during the summer. So they go and they run these star camps so they can see the human side of us. And they get to know us, and it's, you know, they do a lot, they do many different things. There are field trips and all kind of good stuff they do with them. So it, it's a good program. Yes, ma'am. I look at it from a different point of view. Okay. I work for a nonprofit uh, back on track. I don't know what it is. Uh, absolutely. We, I deal with them a lot. Mm -hmm. okay. And some of those that come in with horrible stories about their childhood, mm -hmm. the parents are addicts and so and so, and it just progresses and progresses. She takes them to rehab. She goes to the jail and takes them. Um, I can't speak to the suicide part, but I do know that there are a lot of people who get sent to back on track, and they go through back on track. Some of them leave early, some of them even complete it, but I see them again. I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. Right. Some of them are pretty scary. Yes. Yes. They, I mean, some of them are very scary. And I will t I'll, I'll tell you this. Some of them, Your Honor, I'll be glad to go to rehab. I would like to go to rehab. I would like to get my life back in order. And the judge says, okay, you can, you can go. You, it, I will sentence you to 167 days. Well, they've already been in jail 167 days. I will sentence you to credit time served, and I will give you a custody release to back on track or somebody else, another. Do you have many people that do that? Are there many places around here that there's, there's four or five. Four back on track is the big one. That's the big one that um, well, was using. Oh yeah, they do, and 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 from what I've seen, it work it works great, but they have to be willing to accept it. Um, but maybe this might be a little bit off topic, but I can't tell you the number of people that I see that come in on drugs, whether it be fentanyl, methamphetamines, whatever it is, and they in, in our jail. They don't get much for uh, withdrawal. Right. They don't get much for it. We don't give a whole lot. So it's bad. I mean, it's bad. It's three to five days of pure hell for them. They're sick. They're throwing up. I mean, they, they, this is going to sound disgusting, but I mean, they're literally going at both ends. And they can't stop it. It's awful. They stay with us. For however long, you know, it might be a month, it might be two months, it might be a couple of weeks till somebody bonds them out. I've seen them stay three, four, five months. They get out, and within two weeks, they're back in the same condition they were in when they came in the first time. I don't understand that. If I go so through something like what they went through, I'm not going to do it again. Yeah. And they're, and they're clean. Yeah. Lynette Oliver? Lynette yes. Exactly. Car fentanyl. Yeah. And I will even tell you what some of them are doing now. They're taking regular old fashioned weed and they're spraying wasp spray on it. Spraying wasp spray and then they're letting it soak, put it out to dry, then they'll smoke it. Y'all remember several years ago. Uh, the thing they used to call bath salts. Mm -hmm. 
where people were was making them crazy and they were attacking people. Called it the zombie drug or whatever because they were biting people's faces. It kind of gives you the same effect. You're not as violent and you don't want to bite somebody, but it gives you the same effect. And I'm seeing people who are doing this and they are changed forever. They are not the same person after they come off of this stuff as they were before. They're even taking wasp spray, and I know everybody in here, we're all old enough. The old screens, the old metal screens that you had on your house that they take, you can take off, they're taking those, hooking the positive and negative leads from the inside of a microwave oven, spraying the screen with wasp spray, turning it on, and it instantly crystallizes that stuff. Take a little, take a little hammer, knock it all off, chop it up, and snort it just like they do cocaine. Oh, she said that the other day. We, yep. back to right, house. we we kind of gotten off. <laughs> We've gotten off, but I'm that's what we see. And the, oh Lord, we'll be here forever. But um, the uh, but conversely, the gun, the uh, the people who, the people who are doing the drugs, selling the drugs. Uh, we have the Hunt brothers. There's four of them in our jail right now. They don't do drugs. Never have. Every one of them carry a gun. Every one of them is a felon. They all carry them. We catch them when we can. We do with them what we can. The thing is, they don't care. They don't. You know, firearm by felon. Every firearm by felon, say is $10,000 bond. That's a standard bond, $10,000. You go to a bondsman, it costs you about 10%. So it costs you $1,000 to get out. Most of them have bond money set aside. I get pulled over for having a tail light out. They search my car. Yeah, I'm a felon. Whoops, got a gun. $10,000. Okay, so what? It's another charge. I don't care. They don't. I give a bondsman $1,000. He gets me out. It'll be this time next year before I ever go to court. So they're free. Now if you have eight guns, which we had a guy do that, he had eight guns, that's $80,000. $10,000 per charge. He was in jail about two weeks. So our legal system, and I'm gonna say this from the legal system side, needs to be a little more difficult on these folks, you know. I'm sure, and, and I know I've seen rehab work for many people. But for these people who carry guns all the time, they don't care. They get caught, oh well, it's just another little charge to me. You know, yes ma'am. Can you give us your thoughts on background checks? Background checks, background checks are a good thing but they catch very few. The ones they catch, I'm glad they do. You know, but you know, there are folks that have concealed carry permits that got them legally, did the whole background investigation, they've got no charges anywhere, no domestic violence charges, nothing. They go off the handle one day. And we we had a we had a guy that he moved here. I don't remember where he was from. It was out west, but he got a North Carolina concealed carry permit. He was taking drugs, psychotropic drugs for schizophrenia, but he was able to get a gun. They didn't catch it. You know, a lot of things fall through the cracks. J just for instance. When I joined the sheriff's office, I had to have my DD-214. You have to send it in to sheriff standards so they can check everything, make sure everything's all right. Well, after I'd been at the sheriff's office about four or five months, they said, we're going to suspend you because your DD-214 doesn't have the nature of your, the, excuse me, the characterization of your discharge, whether it's honorable, other than honorable, dishonorable, whatever. Well, the only reason you get a DD-214 is because it's got that on there. Well, they had it. They just overlooked it. I sent it right back to them with a big circle and a bunch of arrows. <laughs> Same one I sent when I, when I joined. 
Things like that fall through the cracks. Somebody looks over, oh, looks good to me. They need to do a better job. They're still not going to catch them. Um, one last thing. One last thing. Now you forgot where I was going with it. Um, these, the weapons that people carry, criminals are always going to find them. They're always going to get them. It's going to be, it's almost going to be impossible to stop. All the laws, regulations, you can put as many out there as you want to. They're out there already, just like I said before. Firearm by felon. That is, that's illegal. That is a, it's another felony charge. They don't care. They're going to get them. They're going to find them. They're going to have them. So, sure. We don't check on those. The uh, the ATFE checks on those. They have uh, they have annual inspections or semi-annual inspections that an ATFE officer will come in, go over all their paperwork, and then take that paperwork because they have the it, the documentation is it's pretty intense when you buy a weapon and when they have the the gun stores actually have to keep and what they have to send off to the ATF or ATFE now so um, they're inspected at least annually and then everybody that everybody that they've sold weapons to they they run backgrounds on them just to see if their name pops up on anything It is. It's it's a it's a nightmare for us. It is. It is. And, and, you know, criminals are getting bolder. They know on Sunday morning, what's at church on Sunday morning other than people? Money. Yeah. They know it. You know, there, there are several churches around here that uh, some of my cohorts and I have, um, have actually conferred with. And if you want to, prote you know, protect yourself, this is what you're going to have to do. Right, you, it, it is against the law to carry a weapon concealed if you do not have a permit. Right. But anybody can go buy one with you. A concealed carry permit, all that does for me is when I go buy one, I can take it home with me that day. If you don't have one, it's five days. Unless it's a shotgun or a rifle. Then you can take that home right away. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Oh, bless you. Yeah, but it's 
Well, I, you know what? I wish we could all just go and I could walk you, just walk you through our jail and just let you see some of the nut jobs that are in there. Like, I left here in 1993 to join the Navy. I moved back here in 2015. This is not the little Mayberry that I grew up in. Now, I know, I know, you know, a lot of you that have lived here your whole lives or been here for a long time. But, you know, from 1993 to 2015, I mean, I would come home for a few days at a time on leave or, you know, whatever. I didn't see the big changes. And even when I moved back here, I didn't see that much. 2019, when I started working for the sheriff's office, it was an eye-opener. Big time. So I can't, I can't tell you what to do. I can't tell you why. It's all up to you on how you protect yourself. But y'all, all I can tell you to do is be careful. Because people out there, they don't care. There are some that don't. They have no regard for you. They have no regard for me. In fact, people will come looking for me because I've got their tail in jail. You know, And I see them all the time. Most of them are nice enough and just go the other way. But and I'm lucky that I haven't had anybody actually come up to me, but um, there have been several that have had former inmates come up to them and threaten them with their wives, all kind of stuff. So you never know. Um, this is something we're going to have to, you know, legislation may work. It may not. We're going to have to figure it out. We're still in the infant stages of this. And, you know, like we're at 20, over 20,100 gun violent deaths for the year. We had 20,200 last year total. So we got a long ways to go. Well, we really appreciate coming in. Thank you. I, we can talk about this forever. Thank you. I'm sure you have opened our eyes to things that we never would have dreamed of. But also, we appreciate your service to well, our Thank you very much. I, and tell I enjoy it. compadres also that we I will. All I will. Keep us safe. Some of them were jealous because they wanted to come too. They, want, they were here for the, the cookies are still available. That's, that's Take right. those back to the jail. Thank you so much. And thanks, Kathy, for sharing your friend with us. Um, we're going to pivot over here to the second part of our program. Um, we're going to tell some stories about our own dealings with gun violence or our own thoughts about gun violence. So I want to share just something that I've written about myself. In December of 2012, I was living in a small town in Connecticut, 25 miles away from Newtown. Listening to the radio that morning, I heard the first reports of school shooting, and as the day developed, we learned that 28 people had been killed. Adam Lanza, a disturbed 20-year-old, used three weapons, a Bushmaster XM-15 rifle, a Glock 20 SF handgun, and a Savage Mark II bolt-action rifle in the slaughter. Included his own mother, 20 children between the ages of six and seven, and six staff members. Finally, Adam took his own life. The rural community was simply stunned. In those days before Christmas, we stumbled through time, gathering money to help pay for small caskets, searching for any sort of tribute to pay, gathering in churches and in our homes to pray for the parents and families left with incomprehensible pain. No motive was ever found for the shooting, and it remains today the deadliest elementary school shooting in our country's history. I had nightmares about these children. I could not get the image out of my mind of those 26 wooden angels that were posted along the road in Newtown, Connecticut. The interfaith vigil, which included participation by many clergy who had buried the children, only served to enhance my pain. How could this happen? And I felt hopeless. Hopelessness that stops us in our tracks is not helpful. It doesn't prevent gun violence. 
And so when I first thought about this program, I really believed that it was too big for me to deal with. I could not figure out a way to broach the subject of gun violence against children in a way that would be at all meaningful or helpful. I was getting caught up in my hopelessness. So after a discussion with Pastor Christina and Pastor Jonathan and other members of my women's circle, I began to believe that there is a way to discussion. Families can lift up and support each other. The different ideas that we have about guns can be sorted out in a way that is non-threatening and in which people can feel that their personal views are not violated or ignored and children can still be protected. So we're gathered tonight as a Christian community at Grace Lutheran to talk about gun violence. What I would like you to do is to divide up into little groups. You can pull your chairs out. If you get into groups of three people, um, and maybe don't get together with the person you came with, although if you're set on doing that, no one's gonna stop you. And as you gather in your group, I want you to find one person in your group of three who will be the observer of the group. The other two people will be people who are willing to tell a story about gun violence. The task of the remaining people, one, one person is telling their story, is to be quiet, to sit and listen to this person's story. You don't need to ask questions, you don't need to make comments, you only need to listen. And when that person is finished with their story, the second person will receive the same respectful treatment in telling their story. Your story might be an observation of something that happened to you. Or it may be, an, uh, as I described here, a reaction to something that you heard about on the news or that you heard about from a family member or a friend who experienced gun violence. Your ideas and your opinions are really a part of your story and we do want you to be able to share them. So if you could take a minute to divide yourself up into groups of three, what I've just told you, I'm gonna to give to you so that you can have it for your little group, so please. <laughs> uh, I was sad to learn that my two other companions here tonight had suffered suicides within their immediate families. And the thing that resounded in my mind is the fact that this made such an impression, especially on their children, that they are still trying to deal with it years and years later. That is, this is not really something you truly get over and forget about. It, it's a lifelong thing, and uh, that saddened me to, to know that that's happening. I was simply going to share, ours was not about suicide, but I was simply going to share that the common thread in our stories, too, was that they occurred 50-some, 60-some years ago and are still extreme vivid memories. I think what the, what the takeaway as, as we just shared our observations and our stories about the violence is we all agreed with our speaker tonight that children nowadays are almost assaulted from the media and the games that, the video games that they have and we appreciate what our speaker said tonight was not every gamer is a shooter, but every shooter is a gamer. And I think that's something real serious uh, that we need to be thinking about. And uh, the other th thing was that sometimes there are just accidents. And Joy shared about uh, on, way back when there was a gun in every house because you lived out in rural Kentucky and there were varmints and different things and there were loaded shotguns in houses and everybody knew it was there. And one, one time, a family that she knew, uh, two boys were playing and the, guy picked, and the guy, kid just picked up the gun and said, oh, I think I'll shoot you. 
and he did. <laughs> and uh, uh, fortunately, the young friend he was playing with didn't die, but he ended up with an injury that he lived with for the rest of his life. But that, you know, it's just sometimes they're just accidents and not thinking. And but the violence that we see, I think, on in Hollywood and in our games, that the video games are are something to consider and. I'm not sure what we can do about it, but it's scary. My story is not one of about violence. It's you'll probably find it amusing, but it was a problem of how do you get rid of a gun. And and my had a neighbor lady who I was kind of caretaker for. She uh, her her husband had died like 16 years earlier. And anyhow, uh, we literally was taking food to her and she was living on her couch on the, on her final days. But anyhow, when I was cleaning out the house and kind of making it safer to deal with, uh, I found this gun and it was loaded. And I, and I said, have you ever used this gun? No. Did you know it was there? Well, I'd forgotten about it, but I said, how did you come by it? And she says, oh, Jim bought it. He said we had somebody come to the door one night, and 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 while we were talking to that person, somebody was trying to break in the back door, and apparently Jim, who was a, a retired colonel, kind of like got real rough with the guy that was at the front door, and he decided to back off. And uh, so anyhow, Jim decided that he needed a gun, so he went to a pawn shop and bought a gun, you know, a used gun and this pistol. So anyhow, it laid on this drawer, in this drawer, loaded for years, and Gene had forgotten about it, and I just had run across it. So I told Gene, I says, I don't want somebody coming into your house and trying to threaten you, and if they find that gun, it might be deadly for both of you. you know? So I says, I'm going to get rid of this gun from your house. So I took it home, took the bullets out of it, and kept it wrapped up in a cloth for a while, and then we we're gonna have guests in the house, and it wasn't good to have this thing laying around, even wrapped up in a, so I hid it real well. And for years, we couldn't find that gun. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it, it, was it was a standing joke in the family that if something came up visiting, it was next to the gun. You know? So anyhow, one day, Joy spotted this cloth underneath the bookcase. And apparently, in a quick clean of the house, because we were gonna have guests, I threw it underneath the bookcase, and it was way back against the wall. So if you went by and looked under it, you couldn't see it. I was lost, and I have been found, and the kids, <laughs> kids knew right away. Yeah. So then, so the next thing is, is uh, I didn't want to keep the gun, and I actually contacted the sheriff's office to see what was legal for me to do, you know, and I says, can I give it away? Yeah. Do I need to register the transfer? No. And uh, so anyhow, I talked to my son-in-law, and he actually was looking for a gun because he loves, at that time he was living in Colorado, and he needed a gun when they went on camping trips because uh, the wild animals there were a threat. And, and the strategy was you had a gun as a noisemaker. You didn't, didn't use it to shoot the animals, you used it to sh scare them away and, and probably scare everybody else around uh, too. So uh, I talked to Barry Pierce. I said, I, I really need to, I want to make sure this gun is safe and I want to give it to my my son-in-law, what do I do with it now? And the first thing Barry did is he, he gave me a, a cable lock. It's a cable you stick through the barrel and you take, you, you open the gun up and you stick it through and you, it locks, the cable locks. And so I had that and then I bought another box with a lock and key to lock the gun up. So it was kind of double locked. And uh, so uh, I don't even remember how we got it to Colorado. Okay, 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 yeah, he was able to, 
it was le he was able to legally put it in his name. And he took it to him to, to Colorado. Well, anyhow, when they moved to Japan, they uh, had the house packed up and put away in storage. And when they got back to Omaha, uh, he found the stuff. But when he got the gun box, it was empty. The locked box was empty. I says, Jeremy, how could they get that box over? He says, well, I kept the key in my rifle box. So they found the key in the rifle box and unlocked the pistol box, stole the pistol, locked the box again. And so, you know, this is a long time. <laughs> they couldn't even identify who was packing this stuff. So anyhow, this, the, I guess the story here is, is that you, it's very difficult to make it safe to have a gun around. And you, it's hard to give it away. It's, it's easy for somebody to steal. So anyhow, just for that bit of information. All right, we've just got 45 more minutes to go. I'm kidding. <laughs> now I do want to just uh, wrap us up. And first, just to say uh, a tremendous thank you to our speaker for being here. And thank you again for your service to our country and to our community. Uh, really, thank you very much. I <laughs> also want to say a thank you to everyone for coming out tonight. This is obviously, um, gun violence against children is a tremendous problem. I think if, uh, w while there might be a variety of opinions in the room, I think we can all agree um, that it is a tremendous problem that does need our attention. Uh, we may at times be at a loss for what to do because we have a variety of different opinions. What I would like to encourage you to do is to continue staying in conversation with people, listening to stories and listening to people's opinions that don't always agree with you. Uh, one of my greatest concerns about our country this day is that we continue to move ourselves into smaller and smaller little ecosystems. The news that we take in already agrees with us. Uh, the people we talk to already agree with us. And, and we don't solve problems by doing that. We just continue to, to, to divide ourselves and separate ourselves when we do that. But I do want to share um, just kind of two stories that I hear um, that, that maybe you hear, but maybe you don't hear. Um, I'm married to a public school teacher, and I have um, school-age children. And both of these stories um, come out of their own context. Um, whether you know it or not, um, in public schools, they have act active shooter drills. Oh, OK. <laughs> They have active shooter drills um, every single month. Every month they do active shooter drills. And before school starts every year, um, teachers and staff go through active shooter training. One of the things that um, our public school teachers have to think about these days is if they have an active shooter in the building and they're on internal lockdown and there's a student in the hallway, what do they do? Do they open the door and let that child in thus creating a way in for the shooter to come and shoot the 25 students in there, or do they leave the student out in the hallway? That's a really hard decision, and I can promise you, being married to a school teacher, that weighs on them. They toss and turn at night. I apologize if this gets a little bit political, but I get sick and tired of hearing politicians talk about school teachers indoctrinating kids. You know why? They don't have the time to because they're trying to decide do they keep the 25 kids in their classroom alive or do they let the one child in the hallway die. That's something that your neighbors have to wrestle with. And I will not apologize about it. The other story I hear is that school children, taking it upon themselves, will pack active shooter kits on their own to handle situations if an active shooter comes in. Kids are told to do one of three things. You run, you hide, or you fight. One of the things that was a sobering reality for me is that one of the things that they pack in their active shooter kits are earbuds. Because if they decide that they're going to hide or play dead, they lay on the floor and they put the earbuds in and they play calming music to hopefully drown out the sound of gunshots so that they don't jump. 
Or if they decide to fight, they put the earbuds in and they play their pump-up music so they can get an adrenaline rush as they rush the shooter and almost certainly die. Now whether you think that's a good idea or not, our 10-year-olds, our 15-year-olds, our 18-year-olds are having to think that way. When I was in school, I didn't think that way. I didn't worry about that at all. Our speaker mentioned Columbine. I was a senior in high school when that happened. I remember I got home and the news was running stories about Columbine. And you know what? For three hours, I didn't think it was real. I thought it was a made-for-TV movie because that stuff just didn't happen. The next day, I was in school and a couple of morons had the idea of setting firecrackers off in the cafeteria. I wasn't in the cafeteria at the time, but I remember seeing students running terrified by the window because they thought there was a shooter. Now that's just my story. So I want you to think about kids who are in school now who see these stories all the time. They live this every single day. Again, as a parent of a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 3-year-old, I can assure you, kids are traumatized by every month having to do these drills and by constantly seeing these stories. I'm not going to give you any solutions on what we should do. I have my opinions and you have yours. But what I want to encourage you to do is to keep on talking, to keep having conversations. We do these one-off things every once in a while where we talk about it, we get passionate about it, and then we forget about it until the next news story comes out. I want you to talk about it. I want you to disagree. I want you to disagree well with one another. And together, hopefully, one day, we can make a difference. We can bring an end to this. Let's pray. Good and gracious God, I give you thanks this night for this group of people who have gathered here, for their willingness to look at hard situations that are before us, situations around gun violence. I give you thanks for their willingness to have conversation, and I pray that they will continue these conversations and expand these conversations, and that together we can make decisions that will help protect our children and our neighbors. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.